I do believe you know, that, that, that if we walk away from here and then don't address those unresolved issues, uh, then we have a, uh, uh, a problem because we haven't fulfilled the objectives of this meeting. I think, uh, I think it's true to say the building blocks for success or for future success in the uh, relative roles and responsibilities of uh, the various components of, uh, of the veterinary profession are uh, well defined. I think there's very good agreement uh, across, the, across the room uh, on the uh, guidelines that have been prepared by the OIE under the guidance of the national representatives uh, uh, who support that. And, and I'd just like to say that Galvmed very much supports those, uh, uh, those guidelines. We definitely have a, a vested interest in seeing the success and in, in the proper application of those, uh, those guidelines. Um, it's not an area where I think the Galvmed in itself is going to be leading the charge. I think we have other perhaps more uh, uh, fundamental uh, uh, approaches that we need to be taking, but we will definitely want to continue to be involved and to continue to have a seat at the table as these discussions progress and to offer our support, uh, practical and, um, uh, and uh, uh, philosophical, in any situation that we can uh, where, it's, uh, where it's going to begin to address the uh, unmet needs at field level. And, and that brings me on, I think, to my last point, which is that we, I, I think it's, it's salutary to remind ourselves why we're here. We're not actually here to protect the veterinary profession or the veterinary paraprofessional prof profession. We're here because we need to have a system in place, a set of structures in place which protect the, uh, the customers who we serve, the customers being livestock or animals in terms of the uh, welfare and health of those animals and the farmers who own those animals in terms of the economic benefit that they derive from it. We're, we're here to try and stimulate that and to make sure that they are properly protected in the environment uh, that, that, that we all work in. Um, and it's not really, in my mind, acceptable to impose rules or regulations which, don't, which, which, which serve the purposes of the profession or the professions, but don't meet the needs of, of the customers. It's, it's, it's just not acceptable that we say, um, you know, you can or can't do this, this, this person, when in fact at field level, the farmer cannot get anybody to do the work that needs to be done uh, to protect his animal. And I think this maybe brings in an area which we haven't discussed, which is the whole risk reward benefit. Uh, assessment and, and maybe I can just use three examples uh, because there, there are different levels of, of risk in each of the things we're looking at. If we take an example like Newcastle disease, Newcastle disease when it goes through a population maybe wipes out 80% of the chickens in one go. Massive economic loss, uh, welfare issues, uh, mortalities in the chickens, loss of productivity, chronically affected, infected uh, birds. It's treated by an eye drop, typically. There's no intervention in the animal. It's a simple procedure. And the downside of it, if the vaccine isn't administered properly, is the bird is no worse off than it would have been if it hadn't been vaccinated. The downside risk is limited. Now, obviously, there's an importance in making sure the vaccine is properly administered, because the farmer, not least, should be paying for that. And he, he deserves. Uh, when he pays for it, to be, sh to be comfortable that the, the job has been done properly and the vaccine has been administered properly. The costs are limited. It's maybe five cents a dose to put a, put a vaccine to a bird. And I would argue that the downside risk associated with that intervention is, is limited. There's not a lot that can go wrong. You then move to the next level, which is the, for example, PPR vaccination. We're all expecting, hoping that we're going to see a significant program initiated, significant funding behind it, um, where there's uh, we, for, for the uh, eventual eradication of PPR in sheep and goats. That's going to need a lot of uh, people uh, to, to administer it. And the veterinary profession just does not have the means of delivering against that expectation. If we're talking hundreds of millions of doses uh, of Newcastle disease uh, to be given, we're certainly talking of tens of millions of doses of uh, PPR vaccination which need to be administered, and there is not the means by which the veterinary profession in and of itself can deliver that across Africa. But of course, the level of uh, intervention that goes on when you're injecting an animal compared with putting an eye drop 
is significant and therefore there is a higher risk of things going wrong, of vaccines not being properly administered, and there's a higher level of training that needs to be administered or needs to be followed in order to be sure that a vaccine, especially in an eradication scheme, is being properly uh, administered. So that perhaps brings in another level of training, another level of expectation, but still a large number of people that are needed. And then taking it to the other extreme, there's sort of uh, the, um, the, the need for um, caesarean sections or, or, or um, interventionist surgery. And clearly that takes a very skilled professional, it takes a high level of uh, competence, a lot of training, there's a higher degree of risk, there's a higher, uh, higher level of economic loss associated with it, and that can and should only be undertaken by uh, properly, fully trained professionals.